Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thanks. My name is Tim. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, my date of sobriety is the 24th of July, 1993. Uh, my home group is the Brick Lane Big Book Study in London. We meet at six o'clock on a Saturday and about 20 of us go for curry afterwards. So if you're in London, find me. <laughs> I've got some cards. You can take my card at the end. We'll be very pleased to... Uh, uh, welcome you and entertain you. Um, and one of the reasons I like my home group is because at the end, and this actually moves me to think this, at the end we say, um, if anyone is able to offer sponsorship or answer questions about sponsorship, can you put your hand up? And some weeks 25 people put their hands up. So there's a lot of help available and it means that if you're new, you don't have to go to the one, <laughs> the one bloke in the corner. There are lots of people to choose from, and I think that's right. Um, there are lots of people in AA who are wonderful, who I don't think I could be sponsored by if they were the only alcoholic <laughs> left in the world. Um, some people say very proudly, I've had the same sponsor since the 4th of... June 1976, and I haven't had the need to change. That's not my story. I've had a lot of sponsors over the years. I've tried to be sponsored in all sorts of different ways, and um, uh, I've sponsored several hundred people myself in various ways <laughs> over the years. So I've been on both sides of the story. Um, My first sponsor, the first person who I think I called my sponsor, I was trying to get sober in St. Petersburg in Russia, a city of, I don't know, five million people at the time. And um, there was one group. There was no NA, so all of the heroin addicts were in the AA group. And um, the not using bit of the program, the not drinking bit of the program was not understood by everyone. <laughs> So there was lots of using and there was lots of drinking, um, sometimes in the building. And there were 50, 60, 70 people. It took me weeks when I arrived in St. Petersburg to find the meeting. Uh, all of the contacts were wrong. All of the addresses were wrong. There was no internet. Um, I had no one to call. I, I To call London to try and find some information, I had to book a telephone call at a post office two days in advance. It was not easy. But somehow I found these people, and um, we mostly Russian. I speak Russian, so it was fine. Or I spoke Russian. Um, there are a couple of Finns, a couple of Australians, and me. Um, and I could not stay stopped. Um, there was no talk of steps in the room. There was no talk of sponsorship, but there was a woman who was five years sober, Tatiana, who was amazing. Um, and she was the longest sober person in the room. So um, because I couldn't stop relapsing, she said, come and, come and live under my roof. And whilst I remained under her roof, something magical happened and I stayed sober. I just lived on her sofa and <laughs> did what I did during the day. Um... But it wasn't a permanent solution. I was getting a bit of God's grace through her. But the funny thing about being an alcoholic is uh, you've always got a plan. <laughs> and you don't know you've got a plan, but you suddenly discover you're going off on your own, doing your own thing. And eventually, for some reason, I thought, I'm all right now. I don't need to live with Tatiana anymore, and I carried on drinking, and I left AA. I didn't plan to leave AA. I just found myself not going, thinking, this is strange. I used to go to AA, and now I'm not. Glug. <laughs> um, and I drank a lot of vodka. 
And Hungarian brandy. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> um, I was supposed to be there for years. I, I had an offer from the university there to do some stuff for them over a number of years. And uh, it was an unbelievable, op unbelievable opportunity. Um, my interest was 1920s Russian literature, and there was an opportunity there. But I couldn't, I couldn't take it up because I couldn't stay sober. And I knew I had to be in London. Um, so I came back to London. And um, I don't know about anyone else, but... I've gone through a lot of my life being dependent on alcohol and dependent on people. Now, I didn't see people as people. I saw people as delivery systems for approval, support, rescue, salvation, respect, love, admiration, validation, and rounds of applause. And when you were done giving me those things and I had enough, you could go now. I was finished. The delivery system has now been used up and you have no further purpose. I've got stuff to do. Go. <laughs> and the thing is about using people as delivery systems is you wear them out very quickly. Either they eventually realize what the game is or the love that they gave you last week doesn't work this week. The respect, the validation, the rest, the sal what used to be salvation last week is now boredom. And the despair sets in and the disappointment sets in and you don't know what is wrong. And then you go into a new room and there is a pair of eyes across the room. There are 50 people there and you lock onto them and you think you're the next one. And these were my tools when I came to AA. And so I started to choose sponsors on the basis of who could rescue me, uh, who would let me live on their sofa, who I could go round to at two o'clock in the morning saying, I'm terrified, I'm going to drink, look after me. And, you know, uh, I weighed seven stone and had big eyes. <laughs> um and lots of people in AA have, in my experience, is an, is an opinion. I may be wrong. So, you know, if you disagree with me, you don't need to tell me it's fine. <laughs> well, no one has to leave. No one has to leave the room, by the way. If any of us disagree on anything, we can all stay in the same room disagreeing about stuff. That's the unity in tradition one is it doesn't require uniformity. You can't have both. Um, it's my opinion that lots of people in AA have unresolved Al-Anon issues. So I was the orphan with the big eyes and the broken wings, and I could find the people who needed to rescue me for them to be okay. And I got sicker and sicker. And so did they. <laughs> um, I found some amazing people. Um, some women who were 20 or 30 or 40 years sober who'd also been to Al-Anon. And um, I remember I trusted them because I couldn't manipulate them. I remember phoning up. At the time, there, was, there were no mobile phones, there was no internet. And we had in London the phone machines had cards and you, you so you were told when you came to AA by a phone card by a, a meetings listing and by an, uh, the A to Z is the map of all the streets in London take these three things go everywhere with them do not leave them at home so you always have a way to connect and it was 10 to 11 and at 11 o'clock the off licenses where they sell alcohol were going to shut and I needed to make a choice was I going to drink today or was I going to stay sober? This was always the discussion in my head. Am I going to drink? Am I going to stay sober? And I would go to meetings and people would convince me, oh, Tim, please stay sober. We love you so much. We need you here. You're the most important person in the room. And, and all the people you can help if you can stay sober. And I was flattered into staying sober for another day. But then the voices came back. And when the click happens, 
that, oh God, I'm going to drink. <laughs> I'm going to argue with it and it's terrifying and painful. And I drink because I want the voices to stop. I want the argument to stop and drinking is awful, but at least it's clear at least it's like sliding down a water slide. Even if there are razor blades on the way down, there is nothing you can do to stop it anyway, so there is no guilt. I wanted to get rid of the guilt, and when I drank, I knew I was in the power, I, in the grips of a power greater than myself, and the guilt left me. And I remember... I was terrified one day, what's going to happen? Am I going to drink? Am I going to stay sober? I need to decide now. And I phoned Sue. Um, Sue, her nickname in AA was Angry Sue. <laughs> um, footnote, if your nickname in AA is Angry and then your name, you are probably going to stay sober because you're not angrier than anyone else in the room. You just have the courage to express it. And if you have the courage to express your anger, there is a chance you will stay sober. So Angry Sue. Also, she didn't care what people thought about her. So people thought she was angry because she didn't run around trying to make everyone else okay. <laughs> um, I phoned her up and said, Sue, I want a drink. She said, go and drink then. <laughs> AA is for people who don't want to drink. Click. <laughs> so I... <laughs> dial again and say, Sue, it's me. She said, I know. <laughs> she was waiting by the phone. <laughs> and I said, uh, I don't want to drink, but I think I'm going to. And she said, and she said now we're in business. <laughs> and there was another woman called Maureen who was 20 years sober at the time. She is now 40 years sober. And um, she tells her own story. She said, all of the people that patted my damp little hands and said, we love you and we're going to love you till you can love yourself and you're going to be all right. She didn't trust them, but she knew she was not going to be all right and she saw people dying around her who were being told you're going to be all right. She said the people that she trusted were the ones that came up to her and told her the truth and said, you're dying. If you don't want to die, there is a series of actions you can take and you will be fine if you take those actions. They're not easy, but they are simple. But we've taken them so we know how to help you take these actions. But it is up to you. If you want what we have come to us, we're not going to go into your dark hovel and find you. You come to where we are. You come to where recovery is. And we will do everything to help you. And then they would go away and wait for her to call. And um, I, after... 24th of July 1993, I was terrified enough of drinking. Um, and I was single-minded enough, single -minded enough to want only sobriety that I found my first real sponsor. Now, this is an instructive story because he told me all of the right things to do. And he was doing none of them himself. <laughs> And after about two months of being sponsored by him, I was a little bird told me that he was drinking at weekends out in the country, coming back to London, staying sober, drinking at weekends, <laughs> sponsoring me and telling me all of the right things to do. He showed me how to do step one. He showed me how to do step two. Uh, and when the explosion happened and he started drinking all the time and disappeared and then he fell down some stairs and died a few weeks later. Uh, people said, does this not shake your faith in AA? And I said, no, quite the reverse, because uh, I was taking actions and getting results and he didn't take the actions and he didn't get the results. This proved that everything he said was true. 
And this is the line I used yesterday, that God draws straight lines with broken pencils. And for some reason, I connected with him. The next sponsor was a man called Doug, who was 30 years sober. Uh, 30 years old, 10 years sober. He'd got sober also very young. Um, and he just told me things to do and left me to do them. Uh, and it was very simple, very old-fashioned AA. A little bit of big book, but mostly personal instruction. And um, I had an amazing uh, first couple of years. Uh, there was a huge amount of service. There was, there was a huge amount of fellowship. I did a step four in the first <clears throat> few months. It was messy. I wouldn't give you tuppence for the quality of my step four, but it was honest and I followed the instructions I was given. And the funny thing is, there was I had no insight. I had no understanding. <laughs> I'm not sure he had much insight or much understanding about the program. But I followed what he asked me to do and I was honest and it worked. And by worked, I mean I stay, stayed sober. And when I did my step five with him, I noticed two things. The first thing was that my unhappiness, which felt like it filled the entire universe, could be summarized on five sheets of paper. <laughs> and this was not so much of a big deal as I thought it was. It was a few ideas were what were trapping me completely. And also, at the end of my step five, I thought he would hate me. I thought he would reject me. And he said, let's go for a pizza, which were the most important words I think anyone had said to me in AA <laughs> because they proved that I wasn't a bad person. I was wrong a lot. Um, he showed me how to make amends. Um, and again, it was very simple. I wouldn't make amends the way I made amends then. Now I would do it very differently. The amends I've made in the last few years are very different, but I did them honestly. I did them to the best of my ability. There was some subconscious evasion, but there wasn't conscious evasion. Um, it was as honest as I could be at the time and it worked. And by worked, I mean, I stayed sober while people around me who weren't taking the actions were drinking and dying and disappearing and committing suicide. So I knew it was working. And then, you see, the real reason I wanted to stop drinking was because it was getting in my way. It was getting in the way of me getting all of the things I thought I needed to get to fix me. It was getting in the way of money and sex and power and prestige and comfort and thrills and appearance. Those are the seven things that my ego will hunt for and it will knock you over to get to those things. And I was sober. AA had given me back my life and I had a plan. And I had a plan for how to live successfully and it was going to involve those things and i dressed it up you don't call it money and sex and power and prestige you call it family you call it career you call it stability you call it responsibility but really you're after that little kick when you can feel just that little bit superior to everyone else and you can feel safe in a world that you perceive as incredibly dangerous and you build your castle brick by brick by brick by brick by brick and at the end of this at eight years sober you're at the top in the turret at the top of the castle entirely on your own wondering what went wrong that's what happened to me and i tried to ask people for sponsorship during this period my sponsor doug who'd taken me through the steps was was gone he was back in america um and I found a bloke called Rob who is amazing. He's wonderful. He's got a great program. He's now, I don't know how many, 30 years sober, whatever. Sober a long time. He was, he'd been young too. But he did not know how to get from someone whose ego has rebuilt to that extent where you are terrified and alone but still full of plans of how you're going to fix yourself. He did not know what actions I could take 
to get well again. He knew how to sponsor a newcomer who was completely broken. He did not know how to sponsor someone whose ego has rebuilt. Um, since then, I found some people who have been able to tell me truths at levels that I was scared to admit even existed. Um, the sponsor I have today, he's sober six weeks longer than me. <laughs> but um, when I talk to him, it's like he's sober 20 years uh, longer than me. He's uh, a man I found in Bastrop in Texas. Um, it was a it's a weird story. It was via Facebook that I found him. As I mentioned yesterday, at 15 years sober, I went through the steps again in, in accordance with the big book, in, in accordance with these sets of tapes. And it turns out that I, I meet this man over the internet who um, who was the best friend of the two people that made the tapes. So, and, and I didn't look for him. I found myself in a big book group on Facebook and I'm talk, I, I decide to write him a little note one day and at the end of the note I say, will you be my sponsor? And I did not write those words. My fingers wrote those words and he's got um he's got a sponsor himself and he's got a sponsor my great grand sponsor is 57 58 years sober i don't want to die of alcoholism and people die of alcoholism at 20 years sober at 30 years sober at 40 years sober by putting a gun in their mouths or by drinking again and i don't want to be one of those people i've met people who are sober a long time, who frighten me. And I don't want to be those people either. God bless them. But I, don't, I want to be the people who are 20, 30, 40, 50 years sober, who are happy, who are peaceful, who have good relationships, who are useful, and who can adjust when things go wrong, and who have joy in their lives, and who are in the center of the AA bed. And what I look for in a sponsor today is someone who is more active in AA than I am. And the longer you go and the more you do, the more difficult it is to find someone who will who fits the bill. But if you look, if you want to find someone honestly, it may take a few weeks or months, but bang, suddenly there is someone there. And on the other side of things, uh, my job as... My job as a sponsor is not to rescue, it's not to save, it's not to fix. It's simply to explain what actions I've taken and say, it would be a really good idea if you take these actions too. Um, what I have to remember is inside every person I sponsor is a perfect child of God, but there's lots of crap in the way. If I engage with the crap, I've made it real for that person, all of the ghosts they see in their life. As soon as I see those ghosts, they think the ghosts are real. I have to retain in my mind the consciousness that I am one with you. As soon as I go down to the level of the problems you think you have, it's over. And my, my own sponsor terrified me for the first couple of years was I would present him with these concrete, these very difficult, concrete, complex problems. And he had the uh, uh, audacity, the bravery to say to, to someone like me, <laughs> you know that none of this is real. You know that all of these are pictures you have painted in your head on top of reality. Reality has got nothing to do with what you have painted. You've, you're like a kid that has drawn a dragon on a piece of paper and is terrified by the dragon, but you don't know that you drew it. You think the dragon has appeared in front of you. <laughs> um, my sponsor, the other important thing about my sponsor is um, I trust him more than my own best thinking. And I will take action which makes the sky turn black. I will take action that he suggests, which runs against every cell of my body. I will do things that he suggests, which are the opposite of what everything in me is crying out to do. And I do it. I mean, it's not often that that happens, but there are times I was, I, I've been in a relationship with someone for 
10, 10 years now. And I had a serious wobble about three, three or four years ago. And he said, you need to achieve peace in the relationship before you can decide whether or not this is the right relationship. Until you're at peace, your perceptions distorted, you are not allowed to leave the relationship. You are not allowed to say there is a problem. You are not allowed to try and talk to the other person about the problem you think you have in this relationship. You arrive at peace first, and then we can talk. <laughs> and I had to go home every day thinking, I don't know who to this person. I, I don't know who you are. I don't know why I'm here. And I had to practice patience, tolerance, kindness, and love, and treat this person like it was the person I was meant to be with for the rest of my life. And the funny thing is, after a year, I had massive relief thinking, my God, thank God I did not follow my own best thinking. Uh, I've never got into trouble by following the advice of a sponsor, even when it was the wrong advice, when it was meant well. Um, every single problem I've ever had in my life has come from me devising solutions to my own problems. And what my sponsor, I'm going to finish on this because there are some questions. Um, uh, what I've been taught in AA and what my sponsor is keen on is that I continue to work and rework the 12 steps. It's not a process which is done, then you dance off forever. Because the ego has been there the whole time. It has watched everything I have ever done in AA. It knows how to use every gift God has given me against me and against you. Um, so this is this requires ongoing work. He encourages me to spend a lot of time with people in AA, which, as I said yesterday, means I need to read some Al-Anon literature on a daily basis. Um, and he encourages me to do a lot of service and... So, as I said yesterday, it's very simple. I don't say no. We may discuss how I do service. We may discuss what the best way of me doing it is, but I don't, in principle, say no. And the gifts I get from that, from following the taking actions I don't believe in because I trust the person who is giving me the suggestion because they're doing better than me. <laughs> That's what sponsorship is about. What I get from that is the ability to go through the world, face any situation, being three things, useful, cheerful, and kind. And I, even in the worst situations, it is possible to be useful, cheerful, and kind. And that's what I've been taught. And I'm looking forward to the rest of this meeting. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tim. And uh, now, as we have done with the other speakers, there's uh, coming a microphone around, and uh, you have to keep it close to your mouth. So now you can put questions to Tim speak, and Lars is coming around with the microphone. So who is opening for questioning? Hi. Um, I think you mentioned something about uh, you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Alanon in the beginning. Maybe it was just inside my ears, but I thought you said that. And if you did, uh, could you say a little bit about why you said that? Part of coming from a family that is affected by alcoholism is you get very alert, you get very observant to what alcoholics around you are doing. Um, and as someone mentioned earlier, the great obsession of the alcoholic is alcohol, the great obsession of the Al-Anon is, is alcoholics. And um, if you're not qualified for Al-Anon by the time you get to AA, by the time you've gone to 100,000 AA meetings and nine out of 10 people in your phone are in AA, boy, are you qualified for Al-Anon. Now, not everyone who comes to AA needs to go to Al-Anon. I totally need to stress that. If you're broken the way I am, you'll discover yourself having no idea of what is going on in your life, but you're very aware of everybody else's program. You're very aware of all the other groups in AA which are getting it wrong. You're very aware of what your sponsees ought to be doing, and you think about them when they're not in the room. Now, lots of these lessons can be taught about how to deal with that, can be taught by a good AA sponsor, but sometimes the um, superhighway is found in al -Anon, and there's some really good literature. Someone else with a question? 
have you intertwined your Al-Anon and AA program, or do you keep them kind of separate from one another? Um, when I'm in AA, I speak AA. When I'm in Al-Anon, I, I mean, I, I know I mentioned Al-Anon tonight. This is a slightly different forum. But uh, when I'm in AA, I don't mention Al-Anon. When I'm in Al-Anon, I don't mention AA. Whatever fellowship I go to, I speak the language of the fellowship. Because the language is very different. Uh, you said something about no, no higher power, not having actually having a higher power in AA for years. That's what you said. How did you do that? Um, I did have a power greater than myself operating in my life through a lot of people in AA, but I didn't have the conscious direct contact of when I tried to speak, the voice wasn't there. When, when I try and talk to a power greater than myself today, people, one of the great lines in the big book, this is kind of all I need to know, is you stay close to God and you perform his work well. I have to help other people get their heart's desire. That's the performing his work well. I need to stay close to God. I need to talk to God and I need to be quiet enough. I need to shut up for long enough to listen. And this is true with people. And this is true with God. I need to keep my mouth shut. But I can't hear God if all I can hear is my own noise. And I need, to, I, I need three things to stop the noise. Number one, I need to forgive everyone for everything on the grounds that when they act badly, they're being driven by emotions which are more powerful than them. Just as when I have acted badly, I'm driven by emotions which are more powerful than me. They're not doing it at me, they're doing it near me. I need to forgive everyone for everything. I need to tell the truth. Um, and I need to make amends. And when I do those three things, engage in a life of service, when I say, God, hello, are you there? The voice says, oh, of course I'm here. Now, it comes to me in language now because I'm too limited to be able to communicate in any other way. So it's a bit silly. It's like a computer. It doesn't really understand English or Danish. It's just a, an interface. And prayer and meditation are like that. They're just a linguistic interface. But I needed to meet the conditions set out in the first 164 pages. You meet the conditions, boom, higher power. It's terrified me. Hi, thanks. I'm Andrea. I'm in Al-Anon. What was the difference between the step work you did to begin with and then when you said you met some people and then they said you hadn't done the steps? What was the difference um, between the two versions of the steps you did? Um, basically, I filled in the gaps. Um, there was some... Uh, what I learned, and I've since got a sponsor who is from the tradition of the people that made the tape, so I've got the kind of real live version now. Um, it's a greater under, the, the difference is number one, a greater understanding in step four. I knew in step four that these things affected my pride, my self-esteem, my personal relations, my blah, 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 the third column of the resentment in, inventory. But I didn't know what to do with that. When the book says we considered it carefully, my mind was blank. I had no idea how to consider it carefully. I considered it carefully with the help of other people, and I've discovered I have created all the harm that has been done to me by expecting people to be a certain way. Um, a friend of mine says, uh, the only reason you're ever upset is because you haven't got your own way. If you want to not be upset, you need to not have a way. And I have used step four to find all of my demands that I'm placing on the world. If I drop those, boom, you're there. There are real people there. That was the first thing. The second thing, multiple step fives. Take step five. When I take step five, I tell the truth to a series of people. And that experience has blown my mind. I completed every amend. And that's not a big tradition thing in lots of places. They talk about making amends, but they don't talk about completing. They say, in God's time. It's amazing when you ask God directly and desperate to make them how all sorts of things happen. Uh, and finally, there's a line where it says, uh, I think it's um, page 19 of the big book English version. Don't know about the Danish version. Page 19, it talks about step 12 work. 
uh, most of us spend much of our free time engaged in the kind of work we're going to describe. And it was not until much of my free time, and that's a lot of time, was spent on sponsoring, on group service, on intergroup service, on regional service, and now on national service. Um, it was not until I fulfilled those conditions that I got the promises described in the big book. You have to follow the recipe. That's been my experience. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.